Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to Cornerstone Faith Community Church. We are so glad to be worshiping together with you this morning. If you're visiting with us this morning, we want to offer you a special word of welcome. We are so glad that you are here. As we prepare our hearts to worship God this morning, will you please stand and join me in a responsive call to worship? How lovely is your dwelling place, Lord Almighty. My, my soul yearns, even faints, for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh cry out for the living God. Even the sparrow has found a home, the swallow a nest for, its, for herself, where she may have her young, a place near your table, Lord Almighty, my King and my God. Blessed are those who dwell in your house. They are ever praising you. Blessed are those whose strength is in you, whose hearts are set on pilgrimage. They go from strength to strength, strength to strength, until each appear before God in Zion. Better is one day in your courts, O God, than a thousand elsewhere. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than to dwell in the tents of the wicked. Lord Almighty, blessed is the one who trusts in you. We will rise as we wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord.
First Chronicles 16, 7 through 27. That day, David first appointed Asphith and his associates to give praise to the Lord in this manner. Give praise to the Lord, proclaim his name. Make known among the nations what he has done. Sing to him, sing praise to him. Tell of all his wonderful acts. Glory in his name. Let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. Look to the Lord, and in his strength, seek his face always. Remember the wonders he has done for you. His miracles, the judgment he pronounced, you as his servants, the descendants of Israel, his chosen ones, the children of Jacob. He is the Lord our God. His judgments are all in the earth. He remembers his covenant forever, the promise he made for a thousand generations, the covenant he made with Abraham, the oath he swore to Isaac. He confirmed it to Jacob as a decree. To Israel as an everlasting covenant. To you I will give the land of Canaan as the portion you will inherit. When they were few but in number, few indeed, and strangers in it, they wandered from nation to nation. Fr from kingdom to another, he allowed, them, he allowed no one to oppress them. For their sake he rebuked kings. Do not touch my anointed ones. Do my prophets no harm. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Proclaim his salvation day after day. De declare his glory among the nations and his marvelous deeds among people, among all peoples. For great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. He is to be feared above all gods. For, the God, for all gods of the nations are idols. But the Lord made the heavens, splendor and majesty are before him, strength and joy are his, are his dwelling place. You may be seated. Oh, uh -huh. 
Well, Father, we come before you now. We give you thanks and praise that you have brought us home again, that you have brought us out of the places and the spaces, the trials and the tribulations, the joys, the things that have happened to us this week, that we can once again be gathered together here in your name with the brothers and sisters of Christ, that we can once again feel the joy, the warmth, the support, and the love of the body of Christ around us that we can once again be knit together and spurred on and built up by the power of your Spirit that moves in this place. Father, that we can be reminded of the goodness of our God, the love of Jesus Christ our Savior, that we can be nourished and fed on your word, that we can leave the filth and the stains and the toils of this world at the doors of this place. We can come and be refreshed. We can find mercy for our souls. And so, Father, it is good to be in your house. As our text said this morning, I'd, I'd rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God for a thousand years than be a king and a palace on this earth. And so, Father, thank you for bringing us home this morning. Thank you for bringing us together. We give this time to you. In Jesus' name, all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Well, good morning once again. And welcome to Cornerstone Faith Community Church. We are so glad to be gathered together with you for worship this morning. If you are here for Sunday school this morning, would you make your way to the side door? Our Sunday school teachers are ready and excited to meet with you this morning. All of the rest of you, let me share just a few uh, words of announcement with everybody this morning. I'll just quickly, um, as the folks in the back change the slides for me, I'll quickly remind you that um, we do have the uh, 2004 fall and holiday events calendar that we passed out last week. Uh, if you didn't get one, these are available at the information desk in between the East bathrooms. Um, so please do grab one today uh, so that you can see what's coming up all through the fall and holiday uh, season here at Cornerstone Faith Community Church. Lots of great events happening. Also, this week, in just two days, on Tuesday, we have our uh, Tuesday Women's Brunch that's going to be happening. We have the right date this week, August 13th, <coughs> uh, Tuesday, August 13th, 10 a.m. Uh, we are going to meet here at the church for a beautiful brunch uh, and time of fellowship, just uh, getting to spend time together as, uh, as the women of God. Uh, so we hope that uh, you will join us if you are available at 10 a.m. on Tuesday to, uh, to share together in some great food and fellowship. Sarah will uh, lead us in a time of reflection. It will be a wonderful day. Please do plan to join us. Um, no need to sign up. Just come. There will be plenty of food. Uh, bring a friend. Bring someone with you. We'd love to share this time uh, with as many people as possible. We also, this week, have our Women's Ministry Fellowship Dinner. There is a slight change to the Women's Ministry Fellowship Dinner this week. Um, uh, as you can see in the prayer list, um, Joyce and Ralph have uh, been a little bit under the weather. Uh, and so, as a result, instead of meeting at Joyce and Ralph's house for the Women's Fellowship Dinner this week, uh, you guys are stuck meeting at the, at the house of Sarah and I. So... Uh, please, uh, please come over to our house uh, if you are planning to come to the Women's Ministry Dinner, ladies. Uh, this Thursday, August 15th, uh, we will start with appetizers at 6 o'clock, and we will have dinner at 6.30. Um, please do plan to bring a dish to share if you are coming, um, and all those things you signed up for already are still certainly good to go. Um, if you need directions or information on parking, there is a sheet at the uh, information desk as well with information on directions and, and parking. Um, 
but uh, there is parking in our driveway, in the uh, neighbor's driveway to the north of us, and you can also park at the Bloomingdale Golf Club. Just try to park towards the north end of the, of the uh, golf club and then walk across the street. Or you can park on T Lane or, you know, park at Ed and Sue's and walk down. I don't know. <laughs> 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 but uh, uh, there's plenty of there's plenty of parking around. You just, you just can't park on Glen Ellen Road. I don't know why you'd want to, but you, you certainly can't do that. So we're looking forward to having all the ladies over at the house uh, Thursday evening, uh, starting at six o'clock. Also uh, coming up very soon is Baptism Sunday, and I, I will say, you know, whenever we uh, announce that it's going to be Baptism Sunday, it's always sort of a question in my mind: Will there be anyone who has an interest? Uh, we have uh, at least three people interested in, in water baptism this year, so that is very exciting. Yes, the Lord is uh, the Lord is doing some powerful things in this family, folks, and uh, that Sunday will certainly be a, a, an illustration of that. So we're looking very forward to that. If you are interested in water baptism, um, please talk to me, um, and we can certainly. Uh, have a discussion about that and, and set that up. Uh, but it is Sunday, August 25th. It will take place during our Sunday morning gathering right here in this room. Um, and uh, you can see me for more information about that. Um, one last little announcement uh, before we get to prayer. Um, if you receive our midweek email uh, called The Beacon, uh, you may have noticed in there that I had a little bit about a new device that is available in the um, main office uh, for if you want to use a credit card or a debit card for your um, weekly gift or, or if you're making a, a, a donation for like a ticket or something that we're having for, a, for an event that we're having. Um, that uh, device is all up and running and it is available today. So if you are someone who has been like, man, I really wish I could use my debit card or my credit card for my Sunday tithe, you are more than welcome to do that even beginning this morning. I think, Jeannie, are you going to be in? Oh, Pam. Pam is going to be in the office. Um, she'll be there to help you with that. Um, one little aside that I want to tell everybody. Uh, the first time that you do that, um, it, was, it is super helpful to our accounting if you will give us the time to just put your name and address in before we do that, you only have to do it one time. But then every other time you come to do it, we just click on your name and you can make your gift. That saves Pam a whole lot of headache of trying to link up your credit card number with your name later on. So, um, but it is in the office, ready to go. It's just like when you're at the store. It is available for all major credit cards and debit cards. You can even use contactless, you know, tapped like uh, Google Pay, Apple Pay, all that kind of stuff as well. So we're very excited about that. And um, it is no different than giving online um, through our Square portal online. In fact, we discovered it, it's a few cents less <laughs> than, than doing it that way. So that's kind of cool. Um, prayer list. In, on your bulletin, uh, you will note that there is um, some prayer items there for you this week. We ask that you will keep that handy throughout the week and be praying along with us for all of those people uh, throughout the week. Um, but would you just join me in a general word of prayer today uh, as we ask God to be with all of those people. Father, we again pause now to give you thanks and praise for this great day that you've given to us. And Father, for the opportunity that you have set before us to worship and praise your name. Lord, there is so much that happens in our lives between Sundays. Some of that is great. It's worth rejoicing over. And the truth is that some of that is not. Some of that is difficult. Some of it is what Paul and, and Peter call trials and, and tribulations, the persecutions that we face. And so, Father, coming together here in your arms is a relief. It is rest restoration for our souls. So we give you thanks again that we have the opportunity to be here in your midst this morning. Lord, your word reminds us 
that when we come before you, if we will humble ourselves, if we will bow our knees before you, if we will bow our hearts before you, if we will come, as the writer of Hebrews says, with confidence before your throne, that you hear us, you answer our prayers. So this morning, Father, we do come before you with a prayer list. Many on that list are sick. There are some who are struggling with cancer, some who are struggling with other kinds of illnesses. Father, there are some who are grieving the loss of a loved one, some who have been hospitalized, some who are in rehabilitation care, and others that are in need. It may be financial need or emotional need or spiritual need. Father, we lay all of these before you this morning, trusting, knowing that you work for the good of all those who love you and who are called by your name. Father, for the sick, will you be the great physician and the great healer? To those who have need, will you be Jehovah Jireh, God our provider? Father, we do lay before you this church, all who worship and gather here. We pray for protection of our hearts from the evil one and from his terrible ways and his schemes to draw us away from you. Father, we pray for our relationships with one another, our relationships with our neighbors and the people that we encounter that every step we take may be for you and for the sake of the gospel, that it may proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ. Father, we pray for our marriages, that we would be held in purity and faithfulness and fidelity toward one another. We pray for our families, that you would help us to remain in faithful communication with one another. And Father, we continue to pray for those who you have not yet brought through the doors of this church, those you have not yet introduced to us, those that you are preparing now to come and to hear the good news of Jesus Christ. Lord, that we would be prepared to receive them well. Father, we pray for our gospel message, that it may be clear and bold, that every person who comes through the doors of this church might hear the good news of Jesus Christ. And so, Father, we lay all of these things before you this morning. As we turn our hearts now to your word, Father, we are reminded once again, that we are given a, a toolbox, so many incredible tools in it, one of which is honesty. Father, may our lives, may our, our words, may our actions, may our thoughts, may every step we take be one of integrity one of honesty and truthfulness. In all things, may we speak your truth. So Father, now will you give us once again the wisdom and the power of your Holy Spirit in this place. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Supposed to have it all together. And when they ask you how you're doing, just smile and tell them never better. Try number two, everybody's life is perfect except yours. So keep your messes and your wounds and your secrets safe with you behind closed doors. 
brothers and sisters, as we come now then to hear the word of God, I would ask that as you are able, you would please stand for the reading of God's word this morning. That as we hear God's word, once again, it would fall fresh in our hearts, and in our minds, and in our lives. May God add his blessing to the reading of his word for this day. We read today from two passages from the book of Proverbs. Proverbs chapter 11, verse 1. The Lord detests dishonest scales, but accurate weights find favor with him. And from Proverbs chapter 12, verse 22. The Lord detests lying lips, 
but he delights in people who are trustworthy. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. Well, brothers and sisters, there was a pastor who lived in the suburbs of a large city. But he pastored a congregation right in the heart of that city's downtown. And so as a result, that pastor had to catch a bus a few blocks away from his house every single morning. And so he would ride that bus all the way into the city and then walk the rest of the way to his office. One Sunday morning, the pastor gave a message. The message happened to be on the topic of honesty. And he spoke about how life often presents both little moments and big moments that need to be committed to honesty. The little moments, he said, are equally as important. In fact, he said sometimes the little moments might even be more important than some of the big moments. We cannot look at those little moments, he said, as if they don't matter. Because it's in those little moments when people are really watching us. The little moments matter. Well, the following Monday, the pastor got up, he got dressed, he ate breakfast, did his normal routine, made his way to the bus. As he boarded the bus, he realized that he did not have the exact change necessary for the bus fare, so he reached into his pocket and he pulled out a few dollar bills. He handed that to the bus driver. The driver proceeded to give him his change, and the pastor made his way to his seat. A few stops later, the pastor realized that the driver had given him too much change in return. The initial thought that the pastor had was, well, what an unexpected blessing this is. A few extra pennies in my pocket for the week. But a few moments later, the pastor came to his senses. He realized that keeping this extra change was not the right thing to do. So as his stop approached, he made his way to the front of the bus. He took that extra change out of his pocket. He went up to the driver, and he said, Excuse me, but you accidentally gave me too much change in return. The driver looked at him and said, Oh, no. That was no accident. You see, I was in your congregation yesterday and I heard your message about honesty, about how the little things matter and it's in the little things when the people are watching us and we need to be honest. So I decided to give you a test. (laughs) Honesty matters. Merriam-Webster's dictionary defines honesty as being free from fraud or deception, legitimate and marked with integrity. According to Scripture, honesty is actually nothing more than simply being committed to truthfulness. I've spoken to you before about this wonderful online resource called gotquestions.org, Bible study resource that's out there. It describes honesty by saying, an honest person has the habit of making accurate, trustworthy statements about life, self, others, and God. An honest person represents himself just as he is and tells others the truth about themselves. No one can be consistently honest without a complete commitment to truth. The unfortunate part is that humanity is not naturally honest. 
Honesty is something that has to be learned, practiced, concentrated on. We are sin-prone human beings, and in our sin-prone situation, we are usually intent on being dishonest. Our natural tendency is to be dishonest. We are more inclined to skew the truth rather than preserve the truth. Why is that? Why is that? Lying, deceit, dishonesty, it enables us to cover up a multitude of sins. Or at least that's what we are quick to believe, isn't it? The truth, though, is that lying and deceit and dishonesty, they just exacerbate our problems. Dishonesty leads to wickedness. Wickedness leads to more dishonesty. Deceit leads to selfish gain. Selfish gain simply breeds greater and stronger desire for more selfish gain, which of course requires more deceit. So so we humans, we sometimes shy away from believing that we're actually being honest is better We actually shy away from that. We think we're protecting other people by being dishonest. We think we're protecting other people when we don't ask them to turn away from some kind of sin. We think we're protecting people when we're being deceitful. We think that if a a person was to really know the truth, it might destroy them or crush them. So in the interest of compassion and sympathy, we reserve the truth and, and we choose instead to speak words of dishonesty, all while intending to do good, but we're actually bringing harm. The long-term effect of this is not a positive one. How can a person address problems in their life? How can they uh, correct misunderstandings? How can they most importantly turn away from some kind of sin in their life if they have not first had the opportunity to have someone tell them the truth about the problem? How can they correct a misunderstanding if they don't know the misunderstanding? Reserving the truth hinders rather than helps. Speaking the truth in gentleness and in love, it it fosters resolution, reconciliation, and growth. So it is always in the best interest of both the speaker and the hearer to speak the truth. But the truth, honesty in general, it's actually not just a matter of our tongues, our speaking. The truth is so much more than just our speaking. Honesty also has to to do with, well, there's honesty in our business dealings, isn't there? There's, There's honesty in our interpersonal relationships. There's honesty in our whole lives. Sure, our words always have to be true, but so must our actions, so must our insights, our thoughts. So this morning, as we open up once again the Believer's Toolbox, we pull out an, our next tool. What we should find is that sitting on the, on the very top of our toolbox should be this tool called honesty. So that every time we open up that toolbox, before we pull out anything else, we pull out honesty. Before we attempt to pull out the tools like compassion or discernment or wisdom, we should be first prepared to pull out honesty. In that regard, honesty is kind of like a drill bit. When you are building something using wood and screws, it is always best to drill a pilot hole. Because you see, pilot holes help you to affix two pieces of wood together using a screw. If you choose not to drill a pilot hole, there is a significant chance that the two pieces of wood that you're trying to bring together are going to split. Completely changing the sturdiness of whatever it is that you're trying to build. 
also with very hard woods, hard woods like oak or hickory. If you don't pre-drill a hole and you just try to put that screw in there, you can sit there all day long and that screw's not going to get into that wood. But if you are careful and diligent to pre-drill a hole, very rarely will the wood split and the screw will always find its way through. Honesty works the same way. When we have prepared every thought, every word, every action with honesty, our thoughts, our words, our actions will not be harsh, they will not be rude, they will not be misguided, rather they will be appropriate, they will be filled with wisdom, and hopefully they will be spoken, acted, thought out in love. So gotquestions.org, it kind of concludes this way. It says, an honest person then is motivated by love, not by an obsession with relaying accurate information. Above all, an honest person is concerned with telling the truth about God and fostering the spiritual growth of other people. Those who follow Jesus, the truth, will speak the truth in love. This morning, we find ourselves digging into the topic of honesty with Two passages from the book of Proverbs. Now, both of these passages are instances regarding honesty. One is about honesty in the marketplace, in the workplace. The other is about honest behavior, more generally, in our whole lives. But what these two passages demonstrate for us is simply this, that the Lord detests two things. The first thing the Lord detests is a dishonest scale. In other words, he detests dishonesty in the marketplace and in our business dealings. And the second thing he detests is lying lips. In other words, he detests dishonesty in our character and in our behavior. So when it comes to dishonesty in the marketplace, the problem certainly goes beyond merely cheating customers and fellow laborers. Deceit in the marketplace defrauds our neighbors, but it also denies God. Because you see, when we choose to lie, when we choose to cheat, or we choose to do something in a business transaction that selfishly enables our gain, but takes away from the equity of another person, another party, we are essentially suggesting that God is nothing more than a passive spectator in the marketplace. Here's what I mean. It's as if we're trying to suggest that God doesn't both get invited to something so insignificant as a business transaction as well as church. When we cheat, In the marketplace, when we cheat in the business place, when we cheat in the work environment, we say, God doesn't belong here. He doesn't come with me here. God's for church, not for here. But God is intimately involved in every facet of our lives. He is not maneuvering us around like some kind of master chess player with chess pieces on a board, but God does care. He is invested in the way we do business. He cares as much about how we do business as we do, well, everything. So to engage in dishonesty in the marketplace, in the workplace, in the business place, in our business transactions is nothing more than to suggest that God's presence doesn't extend to those moments. If you're going to bring dishonesty into your business, you might as well just say that God's power is so limited. God's power is so limited that it does not extend into the boardroom. It doesn't extend into your office. It doesn't extend into the factory. It stops at the doors of the business. Now when it comes to the lying lips, well, the writer of this proverb, King Solomon, he wasn't just in in, uh, suggesting that we should prefer honesty when we speak. He was using our language as an example. He says that every part of who we are should be clothed in honesty, whether that would be our words, our thoughts, or our actions. There was an interesting Bible that came out called the Reformation Study Bible, and it took um, the text of the Bible and it it 
inserted all kinds of historical references from the time of the Reformation. It actually suggests that when we come to these passages, it suggests that the Lord's self-revealed character and attitudes are what provide a strong motive for truth. What does that mean? Well, in other words, if the question before us is, why in the world would we always have to tell the truth? Why do we always have to act and speak and think and be truthful? Well, it says the answer is simple. Because the Lord detests lying lips. But he delights, it says, in those who are trustworthy. It's really just that simple. Do you want God to delight in you? Then choose truth. So whether we're talking about speech or actions or thoughts or business dealings or marketplace or whatever it is, perhaps we have sufficient evidence that God demands truthfulness in us at all times. But I think we would still do well this morning to be completely certain, completely certain, that we know exactly what honesty really is. What is honesty? And especially, what is honesty as God sees it? So, firstly this morning, honesty is, honesty is a habit. Honesty is a habit that one develops of speaking truthfully about everything, including oneself, others, and God. Here's a basic theological principle for you this morning. It is impossible for God to lie. It is impossible for God to lie. At a very primary level, this has to be true, because if God could lie, then God can do wrong. If God can do wrong, then God is not perfect. And if God is not perfect, then we have to ask the question, is God God? But because God is above all other things perfect in every single way, then we can summarize that he does not lie. So this means one thing. If there is any sort of inconsistency, inaccuracy, if there's any deceit, any lying in our language, in our speech, in our actions, in anything we do, it has to be on us, not on God. I don't know about you, but that's a startling thought. It is a startling thought to consider, first of all, that any instance of lying is on us, but secondly, I could be guilty of lying about God. I could be guilty of lying about God, and so could you. But sin is sin, isn't it? It affects every single part of our lives, our words, our thoughts. The result is that either at some point in the past, maybe right now, or at some point in the future, we will all probably say something that is inaccurate, even about God. And just as the likelihood is that we will speak or act untruthfully towards our neighbor or a spouse or a friend or something like that, we will probably do the same thing about God. Now, what's more? Scripture speaks about those people who are liars. And oftentimes it describes liars as those who are speaking ill about someone else, speaking bad things about other people. But it also said that liars are those who speak ill about God. For instance, 1 John Chapter 2, verse 22 says, A liar is described as being above all else one who denies that Jesus is the Christ. Satan himself is considered the great deceiver. In John 8, 44, he is called the father of all lies. Listen to how Jesus described Satan in John 8, 44. He said, You belong to your father, the devil, you want to carry out your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning, not holding to the truth because there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks his native language for he is a liar and the father of all lies. Satan 
was said to have not been holding to, to the truth. In fact, Jesus goes one step further and says, not only was he not holding the truth, there was not even one ounce of truth within him. Every word he spoke was a lie. His native language was lying. People say, what language do you speak? You say, I speak English. Jesus says, Satan, what language do you speak? He says, lying. This one passage, it is making it abundantly clear a life of truthfulness has to be the opposite of the kind of life that we see exampled by Satan and all of those who fall prey to his ways. So if you really want to be honest, you have to develop a habit, a life that is built entirely on the truth, not on deception. The truth has to apply to you, to your life, to those around you, and most importantly, to your witness of God. Secondly, this morning, honesty is an awareness. Honesty is an awareness and an ability to not express every thought or action that passes through one's mind. Remember what your mother used to say? If you don't have something nice to say, don't say anything at all, right? And as much as honesty is the ability to speak truthfully and act in faithfulness and, and truthfulness, the ability to choose truth over deception, honesty is also the awareness and the ability to refrain from that which does not move us further down the road to the truth. Here's what I mean. Sometimes speaking the truth in love is knowing when not to say something. Knowing when not to speak. But you might say, well, pastor, hold on a second. If I refrain from speaking, aren't I just, maybe I'm being dishonest in that moment because I'm not speaking the truth when I should be speaking the truth. That might not be true. Listen, I'm not asking you to refrain from speaking whatever truth needs to be spoken as long as you can speak that truth in love for the good of the other person or even for the good of your own self. But rather, what I am asking you to consider is, you ready for this word? We hear it a lot in our society today. A filter. A filter. Sometimes we find ourselves in situations and we have reactions, don't we? Reactions have responses that accompany them. Those reactions, true as those reactions may be, sometimes they're just not profitable for the building up of the other person, are they? Essentially, what this second point is trying to make is think before you speak. Here's how we might say it more theologically. Wash your words and your actions in the truth. Wash your words and your actions in the truth before you speak them or act them. What you are about to say, does it bring greater clarity to the situation? Is it necessary for understanding in the situation? What you have to say, it might be true, but does it actually in some way add to the clarity of the situation? Does it bring greater understanding? If not, let it be. What you're about to do, does it better enable you to serve the people who are involved in the situation? Are you better equipped to love them in some way by what you're about to do? If not, let it go. If these questions are able to be answered, yes, it's probably moving you well toward truthfulness in whatever you're contemplating. If the answers are no, let it go. Knowing what to say, when to say it, is clearly important if we are trying to live a life of honesty. Thirdly, Honesty is a submission. 
Modesty is a submission to what God has declared right. Now here's the hard part of that. Even when speaking that truth or performing that action may hurt another's feelings. Painful truth is always preferable to comforting dishonesty. A submission to what God has declared right, even when speaking that truth or performing that action may hurt another's feelings. Painful truth is always preferable to comforting dishonesty. Here's the hard truth this morning. Sometimes the truth Sometimes we need to hear painful truth in order to be able to move forward to get past some kind of a situation in our lives. And sometimes we find ourselves in situations where we are called by God to speak difficult, painful truths to another person in order that they might get out of some situation in their lives. But brothers and sisters, how often have we avoided the truth with someone? How often have we avoided the truth with another person because we simply don't want to deal with the aftermath that will follow? The fallout that will follow because of that conversation. How often do we avoid the truth because we're afraid we're going to crush that person? Here's the hard one. How often do we avoid the truth because we're afraid it may risk our relationship with them? I'm going to go back to gotquestions.org one more time because it says this. It says, while it is sometimes tempting to lie or misrepresent ourselves or downplay uncomfortable truths in an effort to avoid conflict. Dishonesty is never good for relationships. Speaking dishonest words in order to avoid conflict is flattery. Again, at times, honesty will hurt the feelings of others. It is inevitable. Remember the words of the wise. Wounds from a friend can be trusted, but an enemy multiplies kisses. A friend is willing to wound with the truth. Sweet words, if lies, are enemies to the soul. Brothers and sisters, a friend may be caught up in sin. What they need is someone to speak the truth that will wake them up and bring them to repentance. A loved one might be living a life every day of their life that is dishonest, deceitful. Someone needs to break the cycle of struggle in their life with words of truth. Someone needs to open their door to success rather than struggle. A spouse could be deep into a pattern of dishonesty, greed, Somebody needs to speak truth that will wake that spouse up before the damage to the marriage is so irreparable it cannot be overcome. But these are not easy discussions to have. Each of them has the potential to end badly. But each of them has an equal or greater chance of changing a life for the good. painful conversations, but they might possibly be life-saving conversations. They might be marriage-saving conversations. They might be relationship-saving conversations. They might be eternal life-bringing conversations. And listen, if we have any intention of being honest, if we have any tension of being truth-speaking, truth-acting people of Christ, then we have to be willing to submit to what God has declared is right. Even when it may call for a conversation that could hurt someone we love. 
Honesty is a powerful tool in our toolbox. But we have to use it correctly. We have to become proficient with the tool of honesty. We must learn to use it to prepare ourselves to be ready to use every other tool in the toolbox. We must be willing to submit to the tool of honesty at all times, even when it does not benefit us, even when it may hurt us or it may hurt someone else. And most importantly, we must always wield the tool of honesty when we speak, when we act, And most importantly, when we are acting as a member of the family of God. Because remember, when you act as a member of the family of God, you are acting on God's behalf. And what was the primary theological statement we made earlier? God cannot lie. God does not lie. And neither should we, especially if we intend to speak for him or about him. Honesty is not easy, but it is an essential part of the believer's toolbox. Amen? Let's pray together this morning. Father, we do pray that you would give us the power and the presence of your Holy Spirit every single day as we intend to be people who are honest. Oh, Father, we live in a world where dishonesty, deceit, selfish gain is something we see every single day. Father, all we have to do is open the newspaper, turn on the TV, listen to the radio, and we hear it, see it immediately. Everywhere we go, Father, we are overcome by dishonesty. So, Lord, what we're asking this morning is that you would help us to be something that is so radically different in our world. Father, whether that's something so simple as giving back a few pennies of incorrect change. Or it's something so difficult as speaking difficult, hard truths with the intent of saving a life, a marriage, a relationship. Lord, these are not easy things to do. It is not easy to choose the truth. But you, Father, have given us the best example. And we so desperately want to be like you. So, Father, will you help us? Will you give us the power and the presence of your Holy Spirit every single day as we endeavor to be truthful, honest people? In our relationships, in our business dealings, in the workplace, in our words, in our thoughts, in our actions. Father, we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Will you please stand and sing with us?
Brothers and sisters, living a truthful life is not easy. It is not easy to choose the truth, to prefer the truth, to have our entire lives speak the truth of God. But this is why God gives us such a powerful gift, His Holy Spirit, to walk with us each and every single day. And so it is possible to be people of the truth, even in a world like ours. And so we ask you, I encourage you, I exhort you, Paul says, be people of truth. Go then with the love of God our Father, the grace and mercy of Jesus Christ, and the power and presence of the Holy Spirit to be and remain with you this day and forevermore. Amen? Amen. Praise God from whom all blessings Wonderful week, everybody. We'll see you next week.